I'm Mike Costello, and I'm here with Dr. Iris Freelander, and we'd like to talk to you today about the joy of solitude. In today's busy world, it seems that all of us are lacking in times alone, times of refreshment and renewal, and times of deep and profound solitude. And I think there's probably nothing more uh, restorative that any of us could have than those wonderful times of solitude. Isn't that, isn't that true? And uh, most of us could fit it into our schedule. And there's times when we are just really strapped for time, when we have emergencies and things happen in our lives. But if we think in terms of just finding time for ourselves, time for quiet, then we can do it. And um, someone was saying there's a book written that says that people are selling themselves short because they don't spend time alone, they don't spend time in quiet. And that's true. Uh, if, we're, if everyone who's listening would just take time for one or two days and then see how they're less tired at the end of the day, they would fit some uh, solitude time in. And of course, we always talk about meditation and we think uh, that it's a wonderful asset in anyone's life. So the meditation could be part of that solitude. But more than that, we need to sp uh, spend days of more quiet time than just, we need to find patches of solitude, but then we also need to, find, to spend days where we have quality amount of time for solitude. Wouldn't that be so? Absolutely. And I think we also need to develop the ability to have times of solitude in the midst of being with others. <laughs> uh, and, you know, so often uh, we talk all, uh, or we see people who are so isolated and, and feel lonely, uh, and yet we're surrounded by people. And even when we're surrounded by people, we can have moments of solitude, can't we? I'm just thinking of the times that I spend a fair amount of time in, in meetings. And, and one of the really wonderful ways of, of stepping out of the experience into a moment of solitude is the daydream. And, you know, that's not a bad thing at all, is it? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I remember years ago when I was um, active in an organization here in Long Beach, and my, a close friend of mine sat next to me, and she would prompt me on what they had just said because I was indulging in daydreaming a great deal. So the next year I was president, and she said, now I won't be sitting beside you to tell you what they just said, so you have to pay attention. So it can, be, it can become a difficult habit, a habit that will bring on problems. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think so? <laughs> it can, it can. And I, I think there, there needs to be a balance of, of both true solitude and then solitude or quiet times. And I think when we're talking about solitude, we're also talking about a time of, of quieting or a time of centering. Mm -hmm. And for us, uh, we talk a lot about centering, and uh, we could do. We have done whole programs on centering before, but the the issue of solitude and having some time, just as as we said, uh, as we started the program, set aside every day for uh, uh, each person to be alone is really. Uh, something that has to be planned. And once we plan it, and once we begin to keep that plan or keep that date with ourselves, if you will, then it becomes a habit that allows us to be renewed and, uh, and to be refreshed. Yes, and uh, I think what you were describing a moment ago and just now too was a form of detachment uh, we can detach from a situation and still stay attuned to what's being said. Mm -hmm. But uh, very often we become too emotional and we too wrapped up in what's happening when there's no reason for us to feel over emotional about it. And we need to feel emotional about certain things. But just things that aren't that important of either way, then we can detach deliberately and then and regroup and see where, where we really want to come in there on that subject. And it keeps us from being, becoming angry. It keeps us becoming uh, anxious. Mm. So it keeps the negativities back, and, and we're more, uh, more at one.
mm -hmm. with the situation. It also is a tremendous reliever of stress. And yeah. I don't think there's a, a person watching <laughs> or a person we know who could not benefit by eliminating some of the stress. Now, there are good stresses in yeah. life, and we uh, we want to, to talk about that as well. But, but there are negative stresses that drain us of vital energies. And those vital energies are the, the substance uh, that gives us the vitality that we have regardless of our age. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we allow the stress of life to drain us of the, the vitality and the strength that we need, we become weary. And I, I just think of so many people with whom I talk who are always so tired uh, or so weary or so burdened or so saddened and all of the kind of negative emotions that uh, we, you were just alluding to that take away from the richness of life because uh, of that burdensome uh, feeling that they have. And this issue of solitude is, is a way of combating that. Also, I think there are people who are alone and uh, for a variety of reasons, either their home life has changed or their, their uh, time in life has changed where their relationships have ended. And, and uh, it, it is a lonely time. And it, that can be a time of absolute wonder in terms of the solitude and the reflection and the, the remembrance of the connection that we had with life and allowing us to detach, but not to detach from life uh, <laughs> In, in a negative way, but to understand that at different points in our lives, some of us are going to live alone. And, mm -hmm. and I'm now thinking of a, a number, any number of people that I've talked to and worked with in the past who were just so unhappy about living alone and having to be alone. And in their loneliness, missed the opportunity to have these times of solitude. The, they don't know the joy of solitude. And when we do know the joy of solitude, we never want to give that up. I don't mean we want to stay there forever, because I think only those uh, holy people in India would be able to do that. But it's really a, a wonderful thing when we're, when we're able to follow, to do, to make a plan and follow it, and I was just thinking of another thing. We often talk about deep breathing and how deep you and I on our program about how deep breathing is so essential. And that's the first step to meditation. That's the first step to a lot of different things. So recently, I've just deliberately been deep breathing in my automobile when I'm driving. And then it's been a wonderful, I've had wonderful reaction from various people who exclaim how well I look mm -hmm. because, and I think it's the deep breathing that I've been doing in the car because I know, and you know, how important it is to deep breathe. And sometimes we just have to in, make ourselves find the time for it. And so I would just like to suggest that to our audience that when, they, when they're driving to deep breathe, when they're doing chores to deep breathe, when they're doing a lot of different things. And if they deliberately do that, then they will see a big result because, you know, it brings the blood to every part of the body and it makes the body um, active instead of sluggish. And it therefore affects our brain as well. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing when we can help ourselves in that way. And it doesn't cost a penny mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's pleasant to do. So I just want to really highly recommend that. Yeah. The process of deep breathing. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that you touched on that I think is just wonderful for us to, to share with our viewers is even in our busy lives, mm -hmm. those of us who remain busy, yeah. uh, there are times in the car mm -hmm. when we have a moment of solitude, mm -hmm. when we're on hold on the telephone, yes. uh, you know, the, the kinds of times that we get, uh, we often feel feelings of frustration. We really could be immersed in the joy of solitude, even in the moment, in a, in a very brief moment. Mm -hmm. So often I think we think of the fact that we have to do things, uh, and we do have, uh, have to and need to plan for our lives uh, and plan the use of our time. And a, a time of solitude is wonderful, and a time of meditation is wonderful. But even meditation can be done a, in a moment, can't yes, it? Yes, it can. And I know a lot of people, uh, we've both been teaching and leading meditation groups 
for many years, and it always amazes me how people think they have to form a great ritual in order to really meditate. So they light the candles and turn on the music and have the incense, and that's wonderful occasionally. But to if we waited to do that every time we meditate, we wouldn't meditate very often. So as you just said, we can just meditate just briefly, just one moment. And I've said so often at the Edgar Casey Foundation in Virginia Beach, they discovered that 30 seconds of med meditation changed the endorphin level in the body. So if 30 seconds changes it, three minutes would be would appreciably so. Mm -hmm. And so, and then more time from time to time would be wonderful. But if we could just f uh, take those few moments from time to time throughout the day and evening and morning, early morning, then it makes a difference in our entire life. That early morning experience is something a lot of us miss, isn't it? We jump out of bed or we do whatever <laughs> it is we have to do, but in that early morning, uh, and also those are times when we get glimpses of that intuitive mm -hmm. g inner guidance that is accessible to all of us. But there is an opportunity that uh, just as you were speaking, I was thinking every one of us wake up in the morning, uh, <laughs> hopefully, and will continue to do so until the end of life but as we wake up in the morning there's a more there's a moment of solitude mm -hmm. even for the mother who has five children mm -hmm. and many demands on her life and, or or anyone who has a lot mm -hmm. before them in the day in that few moments uh, in the beginning of the day is a wonderful time to enter into the fullness and the joy of that moment of solitude that that uh, a few minutes and those and just a few minutes in the beginning or the end of the day can do so many wonderful things and so many people at the end of the day as we try to go to sleep so mm -hmm. often we talk to people who have difficulty sleeping and insomnia and other problems and if they would just take the, those deep breaths deep and cleansing breaths be immersed in the joy of the solitude of the moment even if there are others around mm -hmm. but to be uh centered and to embrace the solitude and to embrace it joyfully, I think it would set the tone. It sets the tone for the beginning of the day. It sets the tone for the end of the day. It really does. And I can remember, I've been leading meditation groups since when I still had small children in my home. And sometimes I would tell a group, the only time you can find time for silence sometimes is in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's true. We can find wherever we find ourselves, then we can take time for meditation. And again, I'd like to impress that it doesn't need to be, as you well know, it doesn't need to be a formal place. It you don't need to be sitting in a chair or sitting in the lotus position. It can be any number of places, wherever we are throughout the day. And it, it pays such wonderful dividends that when we once do it, we wouldn't be without doing that. And uh, those people whom we call serene, who have the name of being serene or peaceful or non-combative, well, they're the ones who find time for that. And they always seem to have more time, yeah, don't they? Yeah. Because of the fact that they have more vitality, they have more joy in their lives. And, and when you put those two things together, this joy and solitude together, wonderful things happen. Yeah. And they also are less frantic they're more calm and peaceful, and so they seem to have more time because they're not running about frantically. And so, and then it, I always think how, how I feel at the end of the day. I'm so grateful when at the end of the day I have energy to do the things I want to do, study, read, do whatever I need to do at the end of the day, and I think everyone else is too. Well, we have greater energy at the end of the day. When we spend some time in solitude, some time in meditation, throughout the day, sometime deep breathing, all those things that keep us calm and peaceful, then if we fit it into our time uh, throughout one or two days, then we make it a practice because we miss it when we don't. Mm -hmm. Walking is another simple yeah. thing that we can do, isn't it? Yeah. And we miss that. I think some of us, most we walk is from the house <laughs> to the car and, and then from the car to the parking space and so forth. But uh, walking is, an, is a simple process as well. Yes, because uh, we can use that time of walking for solitude. And so this is, uh, we just have to find that time where, wherever we can. And, but if we make time for walking, then it does a double dividend. It helps us 
helps our physical body greatly, and then it helps our, our mental and emotional body. Mm -hmm. And if we can walk and deep breathe and, uh, and practice some uh, time of reflection and uh, solitude, or even, uh, even solitude with, it's just possible to ha have <laughs> solitude with others as well in that whole process. So uh, we'd like to pause at this point in the program and offer you the opportunity to receive some literature so that you can continue to study the ideas and concepts we're sharing with you. like to offer you the opportunity to receive one of these free booklets to further your understanding of the new thought message of confident living. Each month we will feature a different booklet which will be mailed to you free and postage paid. Simply address your request to Confident Living at P.O. Box 7726 Long Beach, California 90807. Before the break, we were talking about the, the different opportunities that we have during the day to practice solitude. And there are uh, many, many of them, aren't there, that don't necessarily have to be planned, that we are somewhat negative experiences or wasted experiences of time that we could be grasping with great joy and savoring. Yes, and using to our own advantage. And then we need to plan times of a, a larger block of time. We've been talking about small blocks of time, how it, how it refreshes us. But if we, take, if we can plan time just to be alone, I can remember back when uh, my husband and I had small children in the home, and my doctor told my husband, if you want to do something nice for Iris, take the children away for a day. And, and so he did the very next Sunday. And so I was so pleased just to be able to relax in solitude. But we have to be careful that no one sabotages our solitude because my day, that day was sabotaged by a neighbor friend of mine who was a very dear and precious friend. But she came down and wanted to ask me to hem a mark a dress so she could hem it and to polish her fingernails because my vision was better than hers. And so, but I didn't know what she wanted and I didn't know who was at the door, but uh, she wrapped on my door and rang the doorbell and I didn't answer. And so that went on for a bit. And so then when I knew who it was, I was embarrassed to answer because I had just ignored this for so long. And so it created quite a problem in my life. So we have to have the courage to just do that for ourselves. And then when someone sabotages it, then we think, well, there must be some reason back of it, but we don't have to figure out what it is because it would be hard to figure it out. But we have to really just be firm in our own convictions. If we find the need for solitude, find the solitude, then we have to claim it for ourselves. Very important. And to, and to be willing to express that to others. Mm -hmm. To be willing to express it just as you said to your neighbor, mm -hmm. to your spouse, to the people in your household, to uh, those with whom you work, to say, mm -hmm. this is my time mm -hmm. and I need this time. And not have to g go into great expl <laughs> explanations because of course everyone's going to either, uh, or in many cases are going to say, well you don't need it, or they're going to begin to judge you and we'll, we'll begin the dialogue in that way. And, and I think what we need to do is to set aside our time mm -hmm. and to be firm with ourselves and with others in the commitment of that time. And that's true for our time of meditation. Mm -hmm. It's true for our time of, of reflection and, and certainly our time, our quiet times of solitude. And we desperately need those quiet times mm -hmm. of solitude. Yes, and also we need reading time. Everyone watches TV a lot. They listen to the radio. They have all kinds of entertainment that's available to us today. But just plain old good old fashioned reading is really relaxing and restful. And in a sense, we go into a solitude when we do that. And there's so much marvelous information available today, printed information, that we owe it to ourselves to find time for reading certain things. Mm -hmm. Reading is magnificent and you know today we think so much, uh, those of us who use computers yes. and cell phones and all of the other kind of technological wonders. <laughs> but 
the marvel of just a book or or the newspaper. Now, the newspaper will upset some people. <laughs> uh, I'm a big newspaper reader myself. And so every morning, uh, the newspaper and my bowl of oatmeal are <laughs> great comfort to me. And so whatever it is that works for us mm -hmm. as individuals, we need to identify those things and we need to savor those those things and those times and allow ourselves to enjoy them. Um, and I know that, that that's part of my ritual uh, is uh, that morning newspaper and that bowl of oatmeal or the cup of coffee and, and that quiet time is really important. And it, just as you said earlier in the program, very, very important that it doesn't have to be such a profoundly ritualistic experience. <laughs> you know, when we talk about meditation, and of course in the last part of the program as we're getting towards the end, we do want to talk about the value of meditation and having some time to, for formalized meditation. But understanding that there is no right and wrong of meditation. And uh, so often people will come and they'll say, and I know you've had this experience, they'll say, well, tell me how to do it. Mm -hmm. And of course, what works for Iris or what works for Mike may work for someone else, but it may be another method. It may be something completely different that works for other individuals. And we need to be willing and able to do the things that we need to do for ourselves and to practice the, the form of meditation that we need. And I'm not at all saying that I meditate when I read the newspaper and eat oatmeal. But <laughs> uh, just as you said, so often people believe you have to light the candles and mm -hmm. turn the music on and sit in the lotus position. Well, some of us reach a point in time where the lotus position is pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> and, and of course, for the Western body uh, and for a lot of people here in the West, uh, that position is not comfortable at all. Detrimental. Yes. It's detrimental. I know I attended a workshop, a week-long workshop with uh, a group, and one of the people called me the following week and said, are you having problems with your legs? And I didn't know what he meant. And so he said the veins in his legs were broken. And I had mentioned to him during the workshop that uh, he perhaps shouldn't sit in the lotus it's sit in the lotus position just for a very short time if you're going to do it. Because as you said, Western bodies are not adjusted to that. And so he developed really severe problems with broken veins. And so I never uh, suggest to anyone that they sit in the lotus position for meditation because if they want to, that's wonderful. But I wouldn't suggest it because it's not healthful, and we our bodies are not adjusted to that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how the people in the East must be born uh, somewhat double-jointed, <laughs> and that's being facetious. But their bodies have adjusted to that from all their lives, and they're taught when they're very young to sit that way. And so they, they adjust. Mm -hmm. And it is important, too, for us to be open to... Uh, understanding that whenever spiritual practices or psychological or mental practices are based on the externals, mm -hmm that there's a problem. And so often we tend, and especially again in the West and uh, from Western theology and religion and Western life, um, we are, we're very materialistically oriented. And when there's nothing wrong with that at all, we, we don't negate that. But we do want to stress the fact that meditation is an inward experience. Mm -hmm. And so if our inward experiences are prompted and require a certain uh, ritual, uh, I think we need to be cautious about that. I, I just think of different people over the years that have been critical of the way that I've done things because they were taught that it's only done a certain way. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and when the externals become so important, the external, the way that we sit, or the or the uh, the words that we say, or or the candles, or, or the colors, or you the wear. colors, or <laughs> anything. And there's a time and a place for all of it if it's important. But to give up those judgments and to understand that meditation is really an inward experience, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. And that if we're basing it on the externals, then the externals can become really the focus of what we're doing. And what we really want to encourage people in solitude and in meditation to do is to go inward. And going inward is to detach from the externals. And so when we use the externals, if it's the music and the candles and the quietness, and or even as we say in church so often, you know, if you need the organ playing, 
to be tranquil, that's fine, but you need to be able to be tranquil when the organ isn't playing <laughs> as well and when you're not sitting in church. So the externals are really only there for us as a stepping stone or as an aid to bring us to the internal experience because all of the things that really matter are inside us and surely that's true of meditation, isn't it? Yes, indeed, it certainly is. And we spoke earlier of detachment. I think that it would, uh, we would all live healthier and stronger and better lives if we learned to detach in life more often. And I don't mean to leave people behind or ignore them, but we can, when we detach, uh, we can detach when uh, tempers are rising, when anger is brewing. And if we do learn to detach, then we see the other person's viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And we're able then to not um, internalize our own feelings. Usually it's our own feelings that give us the problem more than what the other person is saying. It's how we react to what the other person is saying. So to learn the art of detachment is a very great asset in life. Absolutely. And we, ta we do. We take that on and we interpret and we read into mm -hmm. the behavior of others so often. And we need to really move beyond that and, and understand that people are going to say and do a lot of things <laughs> uh, and, and a lot of hurtful things to us. And many of the hurtful things that are done to us are not done intentionally. Mm -hmm. And I think that that detachment attachment and the release and the letting go of that is certainly a major uh, uh, necessity in the pathway to, uh, to embracing the joy of solitude and, and growth both spiritually and mentally and physically and psychologically in every aspect of our being because we so often we do hold on to those hurts and we hold on to, we take too personally the things that happen to us and around us and we need to, we need to move beyond that. Yes, and to not internalize everything that everyone says because when we are internalizing, it's according to our own frame of reference. And as you said, very often, we don't understand it the way the person who's saying it means it. And I know we can all think of times when we've said something and someone reacts in an odd way and gives a strange answer. And I know um, a spiritual teacher that I had at one time used to do that. I'd start to make a statement and she would just say, well, and she'd answer it in a wholly different way. And that seems strange to me because we need to listen to people if we're going to be listening to them and then answer accordingly. But for our own good and for the good of the people who are listening, to just not let that bother us and to not internalize what people are saying because it, very often it's our own interpretation according to our own frame of reference and we're selling ourselves short. And so often we do sell ourselves short, and it's unbelievable that our time has gotten away and that the end of our program is here. And so we hope that you have found the information that we've shared with you useful, and we look forward to seeing you next time. My and Iris would like to extend a cordial invitation for you to join them this Sunday morning at 11 a.m. for our weekly celebration service at the beautiful Seaport Marina Hotel at the corner of Pacific Coast Highway and 2nd Street adjacent to the Marina Pacifica and Marketplace Shopping Centers. It will be a guided meditation, prayers, spirited music, and a dynamic, life-changing new thought message. Please join us this Sunday. You will be warmly welcomed into the company of like-minded, positive, and uplifting people. And remember, whatever your dream, whatever your vision, you can attain it through confident living. Thank you.